Um, I think we may have one or two other people coming in, but since we're only scheduled for 50 minutes, I think we need to commence proceedings. Um, can I thank you all for turning up? I think we needed a bigger room, but I think it just shows the relevance of the topic and the importance of the topic. Uh, my name is, is Ron Hogg. I'm an elected uh, politician from England, uh, representative of the Labour Party. I'm what we call a police and crime commissioner in England. My job is to act on behalf of the people and hold the police service in, in my part of the world to account. Uh, to assist me in doing that, I have spent 30 years as a police officer, so some of the things I talk about are actually very familiar to me. Um, I'd just like to say a few opening words before I introduce the panel. I think we need to note initially that it's 20 years ago that the UN declared that we wanted by 2019 to have a drug-free world. We've got to achieve that, but it's an honourable ambition to have. But what is so important, what is so important is that as police officers, we're at the heart of driving this ambition forward. And I think that, that that speaks volumes. And the reason for that is because as police officers see, who see what's happening on our streets on a day-by-day -day basis, it's police officers who can make the best realisation of that voice. What we want to do today is to seek endorsement for a, 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 a police statement for calling for a drugs policy reform. Um, and that statement will look at three particular areas, which I shall mention very briefly. Those are harm reduction, decriminalisation, and regulation. I'm joined on the panel by Neil, who's a former undercover police officer, by Suzanne, again a former undercover police officer, and by Peter, who is a serving uh, police officer. Um, Neil will read the statement so you understand what we're asking. Um, can I just comment on Peter first and foremost, though, because it is always superb to see that serving police officers are willing to make their views known, to actually stand up and be counted. And Peter, we thank you very much for having the courage to do so. And it demonstrates what I believe to be a growing impetus within policing internationally to actually support reform of our drug laws and drug regulations. Um, we'll try to speak for no more than 35 minutes, allowing 15 minutes at the end for questions. But with a politician in the room, that might be difficult. So I joined uh, an organization called LEAP recently, and uh, my colleagues who are right and left are both members as well. That's Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Um, and why did I join that? It is simply because prohibition, ladies and gentlemen, does not work. I look old, I am old. I went on my first drugs raid in 1979. And do you know what's happened in the UK? Three things have happened. One, the level of harm caused by illicit drugs has increased. Two, the level of profit going to organised crime groups has increased. It's now a multi-billion pound industry. And three, the level of violence associated with the drugs market has increased. And as a serving police officer, I've experienced that violence and been part of trying to quell it. The UK government, um, a couple of years ago, uh, researched the approaches to drugs in 13 different countries across the world. And what they found were, found were two really startling pieces of evidence. The first one assured that there was no correlation between police activity and drugs availability. And I'll give you an example. We ran um, a high-profile operation in Durham to Sabinir area last year. It took us six months in the preparation of that operation. It cost half a million pounds. We arrested 30 members of organised crime groups. And when we spoke to drug addicts, they said... Actually, it interrupted the supply of drugs for between two and four hours. So criminal justice approaches are not the solution to this problem necessarily. And the second um, piece of evidence that the, the government deduced from that was the fact that it doesn't matter how severe your punishments are around drugs, it again has no correlation on drug activity or drugs consumption. So people are willing to take the risk. Sadly, the UK government is... Um, undertaking another review of uh, drugs policy in the UK, but has ruled out concepts such as decriminalisation and regulation, which is what we are seeking to call for. I've already written to the Home Secretary, pointing out that in my opinion, my humble opinion, this is really rather foolish, and we're actually just going to get more of the same if they proceed down that particular line. Can I just go quickly then to harm reduction? The level of drug-induced deaths in England and Wales is at an all-time high. The average in England and Wales is twice as high as the European average, 
And in the area that I operate in, it's four times higher than European average. And I'll come back to that. And that's just deaths, ladies and gentlemen. It's not the level of bloodborne viruses, amputations because of sepsis and such like. That is just the real top level of, of uh, top line on this one. At the heart of my local policy is harm reduction. And there are a number of things that we can do very easily. One is to ensure that we've got prevention and education strategies which actually work. And we know that the strategies that we have in the UK are less than successful. Secondly, I've supported drug testing in the streets. We ran that in Durham City to be aware of what drugs are hitting the streets so we can advise individuals as to what best to do in particular situations. We can do drug testings at festivals. I understand that this has been happening in, in, in Europe for quite a long time, and in Holland in particular, they've had no fatalities in 25 years of doing this, whereas we have regular fatalities in England. And then finally, we're introducing the locks on into our custody suites, so that if someone's arrested under a, a, an opiate condition, we can intervene, and hopefully the locks on will be uh, uh, distributed amongst all frontline police officers. So that's some of the things that we can do. Decriminalisation of the drug user. A lot of people don't understand this and what does it mean. We kind of put this at the quite stark statistics. In 2001, Portugal actually decriminalised the drug user. Their drug induced death rate is three per million. In the northeast of England, where I work, that drug induced death rate is 82 per million. That's 27 times higher. I just do not understand why people cannot buy the argument that we need to do something different and that we need a totally different approach. And can I tell you, as a politician, there are very few politicians in my position. Having served as a police officer, not only can I remember the locations in which I found dead bodies, I can remember faces, I can remember telling their families, their friends that they're dead. And that's the reality that we need to get across to our politicians to actually buy in to a different approach. So what have we done differently? consumption. Why not? It's going to be safer than what you're going to buy in the streets. So let's actually consider the reality of all of this and can we stop people from smoking cannabis? Let's be quite clear. Um, and we've also got a scheme called Checkpoint, which is a deferred prosecution scheme. And the whole idea of this is actually to keep people out of the criminal justice system and to address the underlying causes of their offending. And it helps to keep people on the, on the straight and narrow, so to speak, and address why they're in the difficulties that they are. We're getting some considerable support from the UK government for this approach, and uh, the UK government is at present looking at eliminating short-term prison sentences, which we know actually causes more harm than it actually does good. So I'm very pleased that the government is going down that line, that schemes such as Checkpoint then become much more important as we go forward, because you actually have to have, within your communities, the ability to support those individuals who are not going to prison. And let's face it, prisons are well full of drugs in the first instance. What we've done on Checkpoint, we've actually um, brought into the scheme uh, people who are actually arrested for possession of drugs for personal use. The statistics are quite stark. 115 have been processed. We only did this last year. 115 have gone through the process. Only eight have failed to engage. And only two have actually reoffended. So I think there's some real um, evidence there that we can make a difference and that we can drive forward different solutions. And at the heart of all this, it's health solutions that we require, not criminal justice solutions. If I go to regulation, this can take many different forms. It can vary from full legalisation of all drugs. In, in the UK, we think that we, we're very happy for people to kill themselves by abusing alcohol and tobacco, but because these drugs are um, culturally not to, within our, our, our psyche, you, know, you can't kill yourself with those if you're a naughty person for doing so. Um, but it can also take different forms. It can actually take the form of, for instance, the recent change in government policy in the UK to legalise cannabis for medicinal purposes. Can I tell you, I had a letter from a government, a government minister three months before that uh, decision was made. It says, the government sees no benefit from cannabis as a medicinal, uh, uh, medicinal uh, uh, tool. So we can make differences, we can change. We cannot actually as well look at things such as heroin-assisted treatment. 
We know for a fact, as government statistics, that 45% of all acquisitive crime in England and Wales is committed by heroin and cocaine addicts. If we want to reduce acquisitive crime, we can actually address it by that means. Last year, I went to Switzerland to look at um, what they're doing there. And the comparison I draw is a, a lady called Chantal who went to the clinic in Geneva. She takes her children's school, she gets her heroin, she goes to work. She's contributing to society. She's paying taxes. Then the reverse on the evening. They compared that with a poor lady who lives in my part of the world. Her five children are in social care. They're not receiving the best support they possibly can. And her life is chaotic, waking up from one shot after another to see where am I going to get the next fix from. So I think regulation can take all sorts of different forms, but the government needs to effect responses. We need to get into, into place responses which are going to matter. Because, you know, the only people who regulate the drugs market in England and Wales and for many other countries are organised crime groups. They set the price, they determine the quality of the product, and they determine the level of availability. That cannot be right, and we must do something about that. I happen to think that prohibition has failed, it's been demonstrated across the world to have failed, and we need radical new approaches. And that's why we need police officers, law enforcement agencies across the world to come together to support um, this initiative here today. Can I just finish with a, a quote from Kofi Annan, and I'm sorry if you've heard this one, but I think it's so powerful. Experience has shown that force alone cannot reduce the supply, the drug supply, or the criminality and corruption that it induces. We need to regulate drugs because they are risky. Drugs are infinitely more dangerous when produced and sold by criminals who do not worry about any safety measures. Legal regulation protects health. Consumers need to be aware of what they are taking and have clear information. statement I'll just tell you how, how we make this and I'll just sorry to correct one slight thing that Ron said is uh, we've actually at Leap we've actually slightly changed our name with the same acronym yes but we're, but we're now the law enforcement action partnership so yes. this statement was uh, composed in consultation with police law enforcement voices from all over the world it was compiled uh, between Leap and also the Center for Law Enforcement and Public Health uh, they are based in Australia and the headquarters of LEAP is based in the United States. So the statement. We, the undersigned, agree that the current policy approach towards illicit drugs has not achieved the desired outcomes, and that new ways to manage this problem must be discussed, developed, and adopted. We, the undersigned, do not believe that drugs are illegal, to, are legal, are illegal because they are inherently dangerous, nor do we believe that there will ever be such a thing as a drug-free world. As police officers and other law enforcement personnel, we acknowledge that illicit drugs can be both risky and harmful. Daily, we see the negative impacts and consequences of problematic drug use, just as we do alcohol misuse and other related problems. People who use drugs are particularly vulnerable to a wide range of physical, social and emotional harms, including physical and mental illness, overdose, Bloodborne viruses, accidents and injuries, unemployment, criminal records, incarceration, harassment, discrimination and violence. Many are unable to gain access to health, social and welfare programmes. We believe that questions need to be asked about a drug control system that continues to pit police against some of the most vulnerable members of our society. The global drug treaties were never intended to be an exercise in capturing people who use drugs and commit no other crimes. Over decades, we have seen police, customs and border patrol agents seize hundreds of tons of illicit drugs, yet these seizures make little difference to the price or availability of illicit drugs around the world. For every drug dealer that's arrested, two or more will take their place and in many cases, violence increases. We call for an immediate end to arbitrary detention, extrajudicial killings, the death penalty, torture 
and ill treatment and other human rights abuses committed by some governments in the name of the war on drugs. In the place of a war on drugs, we call for more humane drug policies that are developed with the local context in mind and after due consideration by relevant authorities and affected populations. Such new policies would reduce risks, provide more humane responses and lead to better health outcomes for the whole community. And they include, number one, harm reduction. Policies and programmes that aim to reduce the harms associated with the use of drugs, especially for people unable or, or unwilling to stop. These include needle and syringe programmes, drug consumption rooms, outreach, drug checking and pill testing, and the prescribing of pharmaceutical substitutes for street drugs. These evidence-based programmes provide people who use drugs with health and social support, as well as a bridge into drug treatment, housing and employment. Number two, decriminalisation. The policy of removing, removing criminal penalties for minor drug offences, such as the possession and use of illicit substances, to reduce the harms experienced by those on the demand side. The offences remain prohibited but are dealt with through administrative health penalties or ideally through no sanctions at all. And number three, legal regulation. The process whereby drugs are no longer illegal. Instead, manufacture, production, sale, distribution and marketing is strictly regulated by the government and delivered by private or public enterprises rather than criminal groups. Regulated markets may take many different forms, dependent on the substance in question, from controlled sale, production and consumption, such as for alcohol and tobacco, to more restrictive prescription-only models. Yet, across all models, the regulated and controlled availability of drugs will significantly shrink the existing illegal market, thereby reducing corruption, economic costs and health harms associated with the current unregulated market and we will be spending the next few months gathering signatures from, uh, from law enforcement figures from across the world but I'll just want to add a few details um, to the content of, of that statement. Police, wherever they are in the world, are really, really good at catching drug dealers. They are. If you gave them twice as much resources, they would catch twice as many drug dealers. <coughs> but that's the problem. If a police officer catches a house burglar or a robber, then those crimes will go down because there is only so many people who are willing to take the risk of committing those crimes, high-risk crimes. But if you catch a drug dealer, you do not reduce crime. You increase crime because you have the recorded crime for the arrest. Say, for example, you catch someone in possession of a, enough drugs that it's clear that they're a drug dealer. You record that as a crime. But what's not recorded is the crime that's there to replace it because someone else steps into that, into that um, position. But one thing that police collectively understand, if they're honest, wherever they are in the world, is that that arrest or that seizure of drugs does not mean that someone has gone without their drugs. It means that someone else has supplied it. And that vacuum in the market, wherever it is, at the ground level on the streets, right up to cartel level, that gap in the market that the police create is merely a business opportunity for somebody else. And the reality at every level of that market is that there is an increase in violence where there is competition to supply that product. That's the reality of policing drugs. Now, perhaps the best definition of what policing should be and how it should function dates back to 1829, the person who thought of policing in the first place, Robert Peel. And he came up with nine principles of policing, the Peelian principles. Now, principle number nine, I'll get this, I'll try and get the words exactly right. Principle number nine is that the test of police efficiency is the absence of crime and disorder, not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with it. So clearly, in dealing with drugs and arresting people, where, whereas it has no impact on the market at all, is a breach of that principle. Now, police everywhere are better nowadays in dealing with media. Any, any police force anywhere, they have a press officer and how to do this. So any arrest and success 
They want to reassure the public that they are doing their work. When you arrest a burglar and you tell people, the people can be adequately reassured that their community is now safer because this burglar who's committing these crimes is, is locked up. But you cannot reassure the public that the arrest of the drug dealer has made their community safer because if you do, this is dishonest. Yet, regularly, any nation will have their largest seizure of, of cocaine. They, they, their navy will have caught several tons of cocaine or or a local community, several heroin dealers will be arrested. And the, the mantra, the instruction to the public is, we have made your community safe by doing this. But this is not true. It's not honest. It cannot be true because we know the police, somebody else has filled that gap and the violence in the area increases. Now, it's not police which label this a war. It's not police officers that called this a war on drugs. It's politicians that did that. But if it is a war, then that misinformation is propaganda. So increasingly, I'm speaking to police around the world who are supporting this. Make, make no mistake, ours is a movement that will grow, and it is growing rapidly. Because we as police are saying enough is enough. You've given us this task to do, and this task is impossible. This task is only causing harm. I did an undercover job um, in... One of, the, one of the jobs I did in, in the United Kingdom in Nottingham. And after four and a half months in, I got introduced to this gangster. I was, I was very pleased with how the success was going. And um, the day after this, two of my backup team went off sick. I was introduced to two new police officers who were going to take their place. I met them in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning, before the day's briefing. I met one of them, I shook his hand, and it seemed fine. The next one, I shook his hand, and... The hairs went up on the back of my neck. It just something instinctively said this guy was wronged. So I said to the, uh, the officer running it, the senior investigating officer, I said, I'm sorry, boss, I'm just not happy with this guy knowing what I'm doing. There's something about it. So he said, fine, we'll exclude them both so that no one asks any questions. He won't know what you're doing for the day. Anyway, eventually, it was an unusually successful job. Uh, Sixty odd people arrested, several gangsters, <clears throat> and then a few months later, the entire cartel was brought down. It was called the Bestwood Cartel. And when that happened, it turned out that the police officer I had instinctively had a problem with was an employee of the organised crime group I was infiltrated. So I, I was the spy in their camp. I was a spy in mine. Now, what's interesting about this particular spy is that by the time I met him. He'd been in the police for seven years. He wasn't corrupted whilst he was in the police. He was paid to join the police. He was paid £2,000 a month on top of his police wages, plus bonuses for good information. Now, in a debrief for that, I met, I met many senior police officers, and Ron and I have spoken about it, lots and lots of senior police. And it is accepted universally across senior police that this happens. They said to me, Woody, of course this happens. With this much money involved, how can this not happen? So this is what people need to understand outside policing circles. That it is accepted that this corruption is endemic. Now I have to make something very, very clear. This kind of corruption can only be paid for from the value in the illicit drugs markets. There is no other form of criminality that can pay for it. But it's not just the value that means that it, the corrup corruption is inevitable. It's because by policing drugs, we keep the top gangsters really happy. Really happy. Because we thin out the competition and we help create monopolies. And it's the existence of those, those monopolies, having a large share of that, that market, that means they can afford the corruption. So by trying to police this problem, we create the corruption. There's a very clear cause and effect there. And, and this is what we need people to start understanding. When people start understanding that, I think the things that we're asking for in this statement will be accepted. Thank you. Thank you. Over to Suzanne, my colleague, another former undercover police officer. So... <clears throat> 
10 years ago, four months and 15 days, I woke up in hospital. I tried to kill myself again. At that time, as I am now, I was a mother, daughter, sister, wife, friend. I have two university degrees, <clears throat> worked as a secondary school teacher, and I ended up as a police officer working CID, doing drug operations, and as an undercover police officer. So why did I want to kill myself? So I was in the depths of addiction. I used alcohol and drugs problematically. And I thought death would actually be a relief. I was tired of the daily fight not to use and failing every time. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I did know that society judged me, made me feel ashamed, and that I was a bad person. That there was something fundamentally wrong inside me. I was evil. And especially as a mother with children that I couldn't stop using for them. Today, though, I'm actually over 10 years in recovery from alcohol and drugs. And it was only in recovery that I started thinking about and questioning my role in the police. I heard many of the stories that were similar to mine. And what had I actually achieved doing all that work that I did? Had I helped the community and served, made it a safer, better place? All those operations, targeting dealers, all those arrests for possession of drugs, all the time, all the money, did it work? Did it help stop people using drugs? Did it reduce the supply and availability of drugs? Did the enforcement of our drug laws work? And it, in my experience, absolutely not. Through my own drug use, I was arrested many times. I ended up being one of those people I used to arrest. I was criminalised further, further stigmatised, and made to feel more ashamed. And each time, it pushed me into a place where I thought and believed that actually killing myself was the solution. Today, what I do know is that many of those that, that I arrested didn't need criminalised. They needed intervention. They needed help and help. I believe one of the biggest barriers of getting people into recovery and maintaining recovery is the criminalisation of those that use drugs. And when I hear again another person saying prison was the best thing that happened to me, that there's something fundamentally wrong with what we're doing. Today as a woman in recovery from alcohol and drugs, I advocate for drug reform, exactly what's been said in the um, statement, harm reduction, health interventions, decriminalisation of all people who use drugs, and the need for Today I'm grateful to be here, um, that I'm part of Law Enforcement Action Partnership, to stand up and speak. And today I want to live. But I am tired of the stigmatisation by society of people that use drugs. I'm tired of the lack of treatment, services and support, basic harm reduction in the UK. But most of all, I'm tired of people dying. Every year, people that are trying to get recovery die. And I'm tired of it. So that's what I'm here to say today. Thank you. I'm not sure whether it's appropriate to contribute something to this panel debate right now. I think everything has been said. Um, I'm here for a reason. Um, I'm not just the police chief who said, hey, let's, let's be critical about the war on drugs. I have lost a brother. And some of you know my story. I've been telling it quite some time right now. Um, I did it this morning. My brother started doing drugs when he was 14. He ended up with a needle in his arm when he was 28. And he was killed by an overdose on heroin, cocaine, legal medication, and alcohol. I'm coming from a family. We had everything. We had every chance as we could hope for. We lived in a nice neighborhood at the swimming pool, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it can happen to anybody. It can ha happen to anybody. At that time, I was really a believer of the war on drugs because when the situation gets hopeless, you cling on to every story you have. And then we were convinced that maybe justice would help my brother getting sober and get his life on track again. Uh, it took his death to start reading, to start getting informed, because I can acknowledge that police officers are not properly informed about what we are talking about. Uh, we like to wage this war on drugs because it's easy police work. You 
search somebody, you find some stuff, illegal stuff, you start looking into their cell phones, you get view on, on, on the wider network, and it's easy work. It's easy money for police officers, and it is good for figures. And that brings me to the other point, um, which is important. That's the econ economics of policing. I have five people like Rom, who I'm accountable to. And every time I ask for a single euro, I have to motivate and I have to be able to, to, to give an explanation to every expenses I'm, I'm doing. So when, when you look at the definition of the economics of policing, and I got this quote from a Canadian website, it is, it's about the evolution and sustainability of policing. It's about keeping people safe in an environment where, regardless of the challenges, we are open to innovation and reform. And in a time of fiscal challenges for many jurisdictions, governments and police services, we share a common goal and that's keeping people and communities safe, while ensuring policing services are delivered as efficiently and effectively as possible. Now this is an important part. I didn't make it up. It's, in, it's online. It's in, in every, I think, every government statement. It's, uh, it's, it's what policing is all about. Now let's put this against the war on drugs, which is just another name of prohibition written in stone in the treaties. So it, it has been said before. For every dealer we arrest, there are three others who will fill the gap um, and take, in, take over the market. Drug use is rising everywhere, and so does supply. Just look at the annual reports of the bodies we are now sitting in, the UNODC, every year the annual report is uh, mentioning the increase of drug use and drug supply. And the more enforcement, the more violent the market gets, the cost for policing and society is huge and the results are non-existent. It has been said before, I can only repeat what has been said before. I know from an active serving police officers, we think yeah, the law is the law and, and drug offenses is still a niche market. Once you get affected by it personally, then it becomes something else. But if you're not affected personally, it's just a job like any other job. And above that, it's easy work. So you can really score a lot of points by waging this war on drugs. By expressing myself in public against prohibition, underlining the negative effects of it for public health and the, and the directly involved people, which means the people who use drugs and their relatives, like me, I submitted myself to several disciplinary procedures. Um, I have not been punished, but the level of intimidation I can, agree, I can, I can assure you was, was pretty okay. Um, and the main argument that they are using against me was that expressing myself in public against actual drug policies based on academic research and evidence-based data, that's something for politics. A police officer does not express himself about those kind of things, because then that's the field for politicians, and we, we have to stick to what we are supposed to do, which is enforce the law. Um, now let's consider me speaking out for more resources in the fight against drugs. Let's consider that I'm part of an official delegation. Maybe some of you are part of an official delegation, but I would be a very good asset being a police officer and speaking in the name of somebody who has lost somebody. I don't think anybody would blame me for such, those kinds of expressions. So, to me, it's also politics. If you're part of an official delegation supporting prohibition, you're also into politics. And that's my personal point of view on that subject. Um, I just want to end this panel debate by saying that times are changing. Uh, a lot of serving police officers are becoming more assertive and starting to express their doubts about the effects of prohibition. And that's a good thing. Expressing one's feelings is not the same as not doing your job. There's some some people might interpret it differently, but just having an opinion does not mean you're not doing your job. Uh, I want that uh, point to be very clear. Um, and after all, and that this is the most important part, nobody wants to promote the use of drugs, nor does being critical mean that we support drug use. We acknowledge the risks, but as been said before, leaving the drug markets in the hands of criminals makes drugs use even more dangerous and it will kill people. So for all the police officers maybe in the room uh, believing in prohibition, just consider it's your son or daughter caught in addiction and maybe we have another decision. Thank you.